Today was the day to do it, right? 
right. So thank you for being here. It's no accident that this presentation on dreams and trauma is on September 11th. <laughs> so, um, I have a doctorate in counseling, counseling education and supervision. Um, I'm an LPC, licensed professional counselor. Um, I said before I visited the audience for the former students. I've been a full-time faculty member at Old Dominion University for the last nine years. Um, I left in May, and the funny thing about leaving a faculty position, people think you retire, <laughs> because that's the only way, apparently, people leave faculty positions. <laughs> But I have not uh, uh, retired. Um, I actually have um, started actually rebuilding my private practice. I've been in private practice since um, 2000. And um, I have a specialty in career counseling. I also have a specialty in working with folks who have trauma, especially using some complementary, alternative, and integrated kinds of approaches. And dreams fall in that um, as well. I'm an Association for Comprehensive Energy Psychology Committee member um, for membership. So if anybody who is interested in ASEP, I, I said that I would tell folks about ASEP. Um, if you want to know more about uh, energy psychology, I'd be happy to talk your ear off about that. Um, my private practice, it's a new private practice that we opened in back, back in the fall. Um, it's Military Integrated Therapy. And um, it's, please know that it's not just for military folks. Um, as a practice, uh, there are three of us partners. Um, Kelly Andrews, who's also an LPC, she's an art and play therapist. Um, so she works with um, kids especially. And then Kathleen Livingston, who's a play therapist and play therapist trainer. Um, <clears throat> so I'm doing a lot of clinical work these days. I'm also providing supervision and uh, also hosting a monthly EFT or emotional freedom techniques um, meetup group. I have a couple of disclaimers and I'll get those to, to those in a second. Um, I want you to know, I'm gonna actually read about it, read a dream here in a few minutes, but I want you to know that I cry really easily. Um, you don't need to try and diagnose me. <laughs> I'd rather be really appreciated if you didn't. Um, but, <laughs> Just know that emotion wells up for me pretty easily. Anybody else have that experience? <laughs> um, and I think the last thing I want to say is um, about my, who I am and my background. Um, you know, I left the university and I decided to take a summer job. Anybody, has anybody ever just sort of taken a summer job before recently? recently? The last time I did that was in college. Well, this great opportunity to start um, working at the adventure park. Anybody know about those course programs? Well, there's this new adventure park that is on the grounds of the Virginia Aquarium um, that is awesome. And I took a summer job working there to help think, get things started. So I do that a couple days a week, and I'm loving it. It's really a great change. I don't work with clients then. Um, the customers are really excited about being at the park. So it's a great change. I highly recommend summer jobs. <laughs> so I want to know about you, what your background is and maybe why you're here. So how many counselors or LPCs or counselors are in the audience? Is that okay. Social workers, psychologists, fewer and fewer, so others that I have my comment for, <laughs> massage therapists right there. <laughs> students, how many students are in the audience? So, I'm glad you're here. Good start on this professional development. Um, it is a private practice. Okay. Community agency or those folks, um, nonprofit organizations, residential treatment centers. Who did I leave out? Oh, I'm covering it. That's good. Um, <clears throat> who has had formal training in dream work? One, two. So this is amazing. 
that, and we'll talk more about trauma being, having a hallmark of night, dreams and, and nightmares, but we don't have much training in dreams and trauma, um, or dreams of period. So thank you for coming. Um, and my intention for today, I'll, t I'll talk about this in a, in a few minutes. And how many of you have tentatively started to incorporate dreams into the work that you're doing? Good. How brave of you. So I want to shift for a second. Um, I feel like I also need to introduce my mentor for dream work. I didn't tell her I was going to do this, but I don't think she probably knew. <laughs> This is Jean Campbell. Two years ago, um, okay. <laughs> Jean is an author. She's um, also a workshop presenter, trainer um, on dreams and body work. So um, she does some great work. So just a couple years ago, I was introduced to her, and um, re she, you really reignited my. Passion for working with dreams. So I'm going to read one dream from her book, Group Dreaming Dreams to the Tenth Power, and that should be on your list. So this is a dream that came after 9 11, 2001. I wanted to start with reading a dream that also has some encouragement to it. So this is one, recorded by Sandy. Um, she says it's a brief dream that I had the night after the September 11th attacks. I want you to start thinking in terms of when you report a dream or when you ask somebody to report a dream. To do it in the present tense, as opposed to, I had this dream that and to re report it as if it's in past tense, to report it as if it's happening now. So that's tip number one. A close-up of the face of Bo Bridges. He looks directly at me, directly into the camera, as if this were a movie. And I know there's something really important happening. He does something with his hands. It's out of frame, and so I can't tell what it is. And then he raises his hand up, and he's opened a lipstick tube. Once again, he looks directly at me and then deftly applies the lipstick. He smiles, and I know this is really important. And that's the dream. So Sandy says, here's what I make of it. Beautiful bridges, bow bridges. Instead of burning bridges, which is how I was feeling after that was a devastation. Here's a really strong man, a man who can take charge. He has power, but he needs something else. And when he applies that lipstick, I think of it as a metaphor for feminizing his power. And I reckon that's exactly what we need right now is this combination of power and gentleness. Power and nurturers. So you get that, right? So what I would like to do here is, I just want to do this, my disclaimer. <laughs> what, just a couple of folks, what are you hoping to take away from today? When you saw the, it's just, it was just the title. So I'm pleased, I'm excited that so many people came because of the title. There wasn't a description. Tell me what you want to get out of this presentation today.
And by the way, we all have that capacity to other people. What do you want to get from Mine is how trauma can insert a message into a trance state. How trauma can insert a message into a trance state. So dreams are trance. Trauma is also trance. So how do the two of them combine? Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Reading your paperwork, I noticed that among how you classify the dreams, yes. I didn't see any revivication dreams. Revivication dreams. Those yes. would be, tell me what you mean by that. Reliving a childhood incident in a dream. Sure. Um, thank you for that. It's not on the list, but you're right. There are dreams that are about bringing into the present something that's happened in the past. Um, thank you. Anybody else? Is that mostly captured? Like what most folks are wanting to get from today? So, my intentions are to raise awareness about the therapeutic use of dreams and dream work, to begin to equip you. I mean, for those of you who haven't been my students, my students know that I take a really practical approach and to share some information, and then we'll, I'll show you a, how to do a how-to, and then um, my intention today, too, is to give you a little bit of practice um, before you leave here, <laughs> as well as provide some resources. So I do want to, um, in my ethical code as counselors, um, the caveat is, you know, we all learn new things, um, and I want you to bring these into your practice, but please know that you need to make sure you're letting your clients know that this is new for you. That's ethical. That's the ethical practice of um, this work. That's informed consent understanding what your confidence is, um, and then if you're using something that's new and different, then please make sure that you're getting some kind of supervision or consultation. Um, that's what the ethics say that's for counseling. The same thing for <coughs> social work and psychology. Well, I'm pretty sure it's very similar. All right, so here are my other disclaimers. <laughs> I, I, I actually had to write these first because I started getting nervous about, I'm doing this two-hour presentation on dreams. And, um, I want you to know I'm not a dream expert. I love talking about dreams. And I guess I have this idea about what a dream expert is. So here's my idea. The dream expert is one who talks about theory, who, talks, who has done years and years and years of research and has read all kinds of articles and books. Um, and I've read articles, I've read uh, books and information, um, but I think I haven't hit that threshold that I would consider myself an expert. I know a lot. Um, anyway. I do want you to know that we, we may have, I don't know, some of the folks that are on the screen here are not folks who are actually in the audience, but they're folks who are in this area who are experts on dreams, so I want to make sure that you know we have a good number of people around here. David Borden, um, who is in Norfolk, and Idris, who's also in Norfolk. Um, Tara White, Paula Justice, Kevin Tedeschi. Kevin is associated with the ARE. Um, so there are a good number of people in this area who know a lot more about dreams than I do. Um, so please know that you've got awesome resources available to you. So I'm not the kind of person who's been tracking your um, dreams for years and years. How many of you have a dream journal yourselves? Oh, that's great. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> um, all right, I do a journal, but I don't have a dream journal. Um, I, um, I often have my dreams. I'll tell them to somebody. I don't always write them down. Um, I'm also not an active lucid dreamer. Um, so how many of you know about lucid dreams? Lucid dreams are ones where you're um, in the dream itself, you know you're dreaming, and you can change the dream. How cool is that? <laughs> so now, how many of you are lucid dreamers? <laughs> so I also don't generally have nightmares, um, and that's actually relatively common for adults too. Um, when I was younger, I did have many anxiety-rich dreams like Unidentified monsters chasing me. That's also common developmentally. I love symbols. 
and the symbol of a portal to me was um, enticing. Isn't it enticing, this portal? Yes. Are your slides supposed to be changing every month? No, they are. They're not changing. They're not changing. Oh, shoot. <laughs> um, do we have somebody from the... Do we have a tech person? This is a math communicating. Is there something that I didn't do? Anybody know? Oh, shoot. Thanks, Susan. Thank you for that. <clears throat> so, yes, they were supposed to be changing. <laughs> um, I'll continue. You, so, if you imagine, there's one, uh, a slide up here that says something about portals. It actually has um, what the definition of a portal is, um, P-O-R-T-A-L. And a portal um, is a doorway, a gateway. Do you know how to make this? Because you maybe consult with somebody to see how it might thank you. Gateway or other entrance, especially a large and elaborate one. I was thinking of I like sci-fi. The Stargate, that's a portal, right? Um, so it's an entrance um, or a means of entrance. That's really great in terms of connecting the conscious and unconscious in terms of dreams. Um, and then I love how words have been co-opted into computers. So if it's computers, of course, it's an internet site. Isn't that interesting? That's a whole other dimension right there in use of the word portal. And what's interesting is when I um, when I talked to Debbie about the subtitle for this, it was on a phone. And so I said, oh, how about how dreams are a portal um, to healing a trauma? And she wrote P-O-R-T-A-L. What I saw and thought was portal, P-O-R-T-H-O-L-E. Which is, you know what, the same kind of thing, isn't it? It's an entryway. Um, it has that boundary between inside and outside. Um, so it's interesting that it's really kind of the same concept and the same feeling. And so working with dreams is an opening. It's an opening for us as counselors, therapists. It's also it's an opening for, um, for our clients as well. And there are ways that we can connect with people differently as a result. So, <clears throat> sorry you can't do my slides. <laughs> but like I said, the, the essence of information is down on, uh, on the handouts for you. So I'm gonna find, let's try to define dreams. Um, <clears throat> so dreams, if you look at the definition of dreams, um, or a series of thoughts, images, sensations um, occurring around a person's, in a person's mind during sleep. That's one definition. As in, I have a current dream about falling from a great height. Um, it's a state of mind in which someone is or seems to be unaware of their immediate surroundings. As in, he had been walking around in a dream all day. So we use this word for a lot of different things. A cherished aspiration, um, ambition, or idea. So we're moving from one application of dreams to something that's in the, in the mind. And this is still in the mind, but it's sort of a projection forward as opposed to drawing from what's happened. Um, and then dream is a verb, too, to dream. So it's as in to experience dreams during sleep, or to see or feel something in a dream. To indulge in daydreams, it's an altered state of consciousness too. Or fantasies, or contemplate the possibility of doing something. So dreams versus nightmares. What's the difference between a dream versus a nightmare? So we know that everyone dreams, right? Everyone dreams. So we have this thing that everyone does. Everyone does. And yet, we won't have much training, if any, to deal with them therapeutically. Isn't that interesting? Wonder why that is. 
I don't have the answer to that one. Um, the most vivid dreams actually occur in REM sleep. Um, there are lots of different explanations and theories um, and little agreement <laughs> about what causes dreams and why you even dream at all. We know that dreams are affected by drugs, alcohol, um, medications. So I remember a friend of mine who um, at one point was um, taking Prozac. So, and the dreams that she had were just amazing. Anybody else had experiences with clients being put on an antidepressant medication and their dreams change? A malaria medication will do it too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so dreams often reflect your thoughts and feelings. Um, it's very personal, they're personal to you. Um, there are different kinds of dreams, and you've got a list of different kinds of dreams. And many people really believe that dreams represent other states of consciousness. Unimaginable. And then nightmares. Let's do a little bit of information about nightmares. Um, so nightmares are something that everybody has had at some point or another. <coughs> so we've got the first slide, but it's not moving. It's not showing up on here. Caucasian woman, my complete shadow 
might be an African American man. So if a character in my dream has that opposite characteristic for me, then I'm looking at shadow work. Shadow work is those parts that we're not quite wanting to either deal with or face. Um, and what Cliff was, I had a boss. <sighs> that was my shadow. And the second I got that message, I was able to serve. Most people don't. 
And so those nightmares and dreams are ones that they help with continuing the process on that unconscious level. We're going to see if we can adjust this. So 
what she's talking about are some dreams that she had that were um, precognitive or predictive and um, wasn't able to really understand them until after the fact. Because dreams are very symbolic. Um, and, um, and so sometimes we can prepare and sometimes we don't know what's going on here. Um, and that can be really confusing too. So you said that you dreamed about 9-11. How many people here dreamed about 9-11 you didn't really realize until afterwards? A couple of folks. There were actually um, the International Association for the Study of Dreams has a website and um, immediately after, um, as 9-11 was happening or after 9-11, um, that organization opened the website up for people to report their 9-11 dreams, their pre-9-11 dreams. Yeah? I didn't have a dream about 9-11, but I guess I had something related to it because I was at the World Trade Center about a month or two before it happened. And in the middle of the night, I was in a hotel room by myself, an alarm went off. And I thought it was the radio. I didn't know, I didn't understand what it was. And it just kept going, and I didn't know what to do. You know, you're in your job in the middle of the night. And then somebody came over with a loudspeaker, like they did in the second building, and said, we're not sure what this is, just stay put. Mm -hmm. And so afterwards, I thought, I should have left the building. But I stayed put. And it was nothing what happened with me, but then, obviously, what happened in the news, you know, just a month or two later. And I know very similar. So you had a similar experience, um, a live experience that felt uh, afterwards predictive of, of uh, I guess so. I'm, I'm guessing that there are a lot of people that had those kinds of experiences and that you weren't even able to put a finger on how that was related. Um, and that's what dreams will do. So it's, <laughs> then we start getting into and talking about altered st different states of consciousness and awareness. Um, it's not, um, unusual for folks then to um, start talking about dreams and start talking about them things uh, that they have had premonitions to. When you're open, you're open, right? When you, when we are open um, and willing to talk, clients will bring us all kinds of information one day. I, I want to make a note here too. People want to talk about their dreams, don't they? And we don't really know how to do that. There's a sense of vulnerability when we kind of open ourselves up to talk about dreams. Anybody feel vulnerable when you start talking about um, a dream? Not sure what it's about. There's this confusion. There's a lot that happens when it comes to um, talking about dreams. So I want to put dreams aside for the time being and, um, and talk really briefly about trauma. The handout that you have actually is DSM-4 information about symptomology with trauma. How many of you have really looked at the DSM-5? Not everybody has. Okay, so I wanted to actually pull from the DSM-5 because there are some <coughs> changes that have been incorporated. And just do some review of basic trauma. Um, trauma in the brain, so we know about fight, flight, freeze responses, right? It's not just fight or flight, it's also freeze. Um, and there's some interesting research around um, tend and befriend as it's related to women and how women respond to trauma, uh, different experiences. And I had this aha uh -huh a couple of days ago as I was thinking about that. But that's really related to attachment. And the new research around how the vagus nerve um, is affected by trauma. Everybody familiar with the vagus nerve? Some people are taking the nerve, yes. This is nerve bundle that ends about right here, has all kinds of nerves, endings that uh, start around at the base of our brain, um, and has nerve endings at every organ in our body. And so it's sending messages in a completely different way than our brains. Um, it's very primitive, too. I'm calling it another brain. I'm referring to it. 
So prevalence, etiology, um, three to eight percent, depending on what you read, um, of the total population meets PTSD criteria, as set forth by the DSM. And um, research indicates that 30 to 40 percent of people who actually experience trauma will meet the criteria. It's still a lot of people, isn't it? <laughs> Um, no one group is impacted more than another. Childhood trauma may prime um, individuals to develop PTSD. And actually, there's a new research study that's come out about the military. Those, those folks who are um, attempting or committing suicide, who are military folks, um, are showing some evidence, no surprise here, of um, some developmental trauma. Um, so some of this, is it okay to just not go over like the initial criteria, I'll, I'll skip that. The changes, um, it's moved, to, that says, still says three categories, it's now four major categories of symptoms. Um, from reliving to avoidance, they've added the cognitive and mood um, alterations as well as the arousal. So those have not changed very much. The, the terminology has changed a little bit from um, intrusion symptoms. So dreams, it used to be that the criteria said nightmares, it's now dreams. That opens up a whole wonderful, more broad category um, for us to pay attention to. And then um, there's also um, just of the seven, so there are 17 or more symptoms of, um, that are listed, and it's only one that has, that's related to trauma, but we're doing all kinds of other things related to the other symptoms, aren't we? Um, and everybody dreams. So there's that persistence avoidance. Yeah. 
So one of the frameworks that I wanted to provide, um, I, I stumbled on this trauma processing model um, about six, or six months ago, and I want you to know something about it. Um, it's actually what uh, behavior therapists will use in terms of keeping people within a framework, within a, a band of um, responsiveness. So on this, um, <laughs> this describes a window of tolerance. So we think in terms of the clients, how much they can tolerate. Below the, um, the lower line is hypoarousal. Above the line, which you can't really see, is hyperarousal. And so in session, it's important for us to work, work within this, apparently it's a sweet spot for me to stand, but not for the mic. It's important um, to work within this band of some arousal, but not, not over. And who's trained in EMDR here? I'm in the desensitization and reprocessing. What I love about EMDR is that there are phases of setting people up. This is what we need to be doing with folks. We need to make sure that we're educating people about what trauma is. We need to make sure that people have um, resources that they can practice on a regular basis and that they are practicing um, and that we're, we're working with them in session. So, so that we're decreasing that high arousal um, and really checking in with that hypo or dissociation. That's what this, this is a great article, by the way. Um, and again, I'll send these to folks so you have an idea. So the idea is, let's see if I can click on this. Oops. So when somebody starts um, amping up their response, we want to make sure that, it, that they're not going into hyperarousal, but they're staying within this band. So we're stopping, we're helping them to breathe or to really check in, be grounded, all of those things. So we, that's our responsibility. Otherwise, we are re-traumatizing our clients. Our responsibility is to see where they are in this band. Um, and so from this diagram, you can see that hypoarousal isn't enough, people check out, um, and that during a session or a series of sessions, um, we want to try and keep them within this window of tolerance. Does this make sense? And here's the cool thing. You can do this with dreams. So with that said, why don't we make it easy for people with clients? That's my rationale for working with dreams as opposed to directly with the, with the trauma. Um, dreams then are that portal for getting around, getting through um, to people. Dreams themselves are an organic nature of working with dreams. When somebody has a dream, more than likely, the dream that they have um, indicates a readiness to deal with whatever it is that is coming up. If it's a clear symbol, um, if it's um, more clear, then there's a readiness to start dealing with whatever is coming up in the dream. Does that make sense? So if in the dream there's something that's back here out of sight, that's a metaphor. Not quite ready to deal with it yet. So if we're able to then stay where people are with their dreams and symbol without pushing, then there's a more organic nature that happens with dreams um, and our work with dreams. I love this um, quote. With this, there's an old Jewish saying that, in the Talmud that says, an uninterpreted dream is like an unopened envelope. It's a good one, isn't it? So with dream work, the client is in charge. Um, like I said, there's an element of readiness. 
The dream itself provides an opening, an opening for connection on different levels. Um, I talked a little bit about different kinds of portals, and I think I'm going to skip that right now because I really I'm seeing what time it is, and what I would like to do is to um, to talk about one method for working with dreams. So I want to describe it. I want to do a really brief demonstration with it, and then I want you all to practice a little bit. So as I'm talking, what I'd like for you to do is to start thinking about a dream that you've had, even if it's a fragment. Fragments, I love dreams also have this, um, I'll call it a fractal quality. So if you take a piece of a dream, that little piece often is a mirror of the entire dream. So don't worry if you can't remember an entire dream. If you can remember a piece of a dream, it's worth working with. So, different kinds of dreams, adventure dreams, Learning dreams, lucid dreams, magical dreams, that's in your handout for sure. Nightmares, practice dreams, problem solving, vacation. There's also ones that are um, a remembering of something in the past and bringing it into the present. There's a great piece of information in your handout about how to remember dreams to, so that you can do that for yourself. I'm a huge proponent of practicing yourself <laughs> before you start springing things on clients so that you know what it's like. <coughs> so if you haven't worked your own dreams before going into a session with a client, make sure that you have some practice working your own dream or working with somebody else before you practice um, with your clients. That's also part of the form of Um So often, People want to go to dream simple books. Skip them. They're too expensive. Dreams are personal. And the first step is, one of the steps in this process is to pay attention to the symbols. They're your symbols. So for example, if a dog um, is in a dream, my dream, that means something different from, for me than somebody else. Um, who has a dream about a dog. Um, if I dream about um, the ocean, if we dream about the ocean here, that might have a different meaning than someone who dreams about the ocean who lives in Oregon. There's a different relationship to the ocean for us as opposed to someone who lives in Oregon or Nebraska or somewhere in one of those landlocked states. So the, ignore those books that have the list of dream symbols that you go and say, oh, that's what this means. People want easy answers. Um, and when you work a dream, you get even richer, richer answers. So dreams are full, full of symbols and layers of symbols as well of imagery and of different meanings. And so um, these are at least three layers of dream symbols. What the dream means to you, us, this is what I was alluding to with the ocean. What it means on a cultural level to a particular area, like I said, with the ocean. And then what it might mean also for the collective unconscious. Um, so masculine and feminine are collective unconscious symbolism. 